they're on their way as well. Well, as Americans, we are enamored by the story of the underdog or the come-from-behind kid. It's like the ball team that wasn't even supposed to place, and all of a sudden, they're in the playoffs. Or the young mom who fought breast cancer and wins. Or the young boy or the young girl who comes out of particularly difficult situation growing up and goes on to to make something big out of themselves. I've shared before, it's been a while, the story of William Gates. Uh, William is also known known as Pearly Gates because of his infectious white smile which would fill a room. When I was at Moody, go ahead and laugh, get it over. Uh, (laughs) When I was at Moody, I was part of a tutoring program in the Cabrini Green Housing Project. Uh, Quaker Oats had their headquarters just outside of there, and they opened up their cafeteria every Tuesday night to about 300 volunteers to come in and to tutor with young people from Cabrini Green. Cabrini Green, if you're familiar with the history of Chicago at all, was a high-rise, low-income housing unit complex, probably a dozen or more uh, high-rise buildings. It was known for crime. It was known for drugs. It was known for trouble. It was known for gangs. Uh, The elevators seldom worked. Uh, It was not a very nice place to have to grow up. Gunfire was common. Even at Moody at night, you could hear the sound of gunfire, and you just kind of got used to it coming from Cabrini Green. Even the police at times would shy away from entering that particular housing project. It was one of many in Chicago, but one of the worst. I was assigned William, and William was full of energy and excitement. Uh, William was only about this tall. You can kind of tell with the picture there. But just a great kid. And William, every night, he would be full of energy. And he'd come up, Mr. Ray, I'm going to be Michael Jordan when I grow up. And I'm like, right, right, William. Uh, we got a little growing to do here. Tell you what, why don't you come over here and sit down before you foul out. And let's let's work on this schoolwork. And he would sit down and we would work. And he would apply himself. And so we had a great two years together. And did a lot of things outside of the tutoring program. And got pretty close. But always remembered William. Moved from Chicago, went to seminary in Dallas, and lost track of William. Got into ministry, had a number of years of ministry. And then as God would have it, by, not coincidence, by divine appointment, I ran into a gentleman who was a friend of a friend of William. And the name comes up. He says, you mean William Gates? I go, yeah. He says, do you know what happened to him? And I said, no, I've prayed for him. I hope he didn't get tied up in gangs. I hope he didn't get sidetracked in drugs. I hope he's still alive. To be a young black boy in Cabrini Green to make 16 was quite an accomplishment. He says, you haven't heard the story. I said, no. And so he went on to tell me how, how William, <laughs> despite what I told him about, you're not quite Michael Jordan, uh, William got picked up in high school by a private high school scout and played high, high school basketball with the private schools there in Chicago. Got a full-ride scholarship to Marquette in basketball after I told him to sit down. Um, would probably easily have gone on to the pros except for a nagging knee injury he suffered in high school. And then a few years ago, I got to go to Chicago and meet William. William was able to purchase his mama home out of Cabrini Green, but William went back. William went back as a pastor to that same housing project where he grew up. Just an incredible story of coming out of nowhere and being able to make it. And as William say, he credits his mom for a lot of that, and she truly is a special person. So unique, though, is his life that actually they did a, wrote a book and did a, a uh, documentary on his life through high school. Uh, the good and the bad. David, uh, William's life was not perfect. Uh, he struggled with a lot of issues, and yet he uh, knew the Lord and, and grew in that and, and uh, just did really well. Roger Ebert, some of you remember him, says of the, the movie, it's a masterpiece. One of the best films about American life I've ever seen. Extraordinary. 
I share you the story of William because this morning we're starting a new series that will probably take us really into the early spring. Aren't you glad? Through the snow, all right? It's an autobiographical series on the life of King David. And I've entitled this series, Friend of God, David. But I'm hoping as we go through this series, you'll be able to put your name in there as well. Friend of God, Ray or Sam, or whomever you might be. David becomes one of the most influential kings in all of Israel's history. But he arose from absolute obscurity. If in the history of Israel, if you had gone back and you'd ask a hundred people, who's going to be the next king of Israel? David's name never, ever would have come up. David's life is defined by a series of incredible highs and incredible lows. We're going to look at both. I look back, it's kind of humorous. In Sunday school, we only look at the good points, don't we? And then we left wondering, well, what happens when I screw up? David did some incredible things, or God did some incredible things through David. He also screwed up royally numerous times. He was incredibly gifted by God and talented Yet at times he was handicapped by his own ambition and pride. He could be and was kind and caring, empathetic, and yet at times cold and callous. David loved God deeply, and yet at times he struggled with faith. Not a whole lot unlike you and I, is it? And I think that's why an autobiographical study of another believer is so important. Because we can begin to see ourselves. And we can begin to see the true character of God as he expresses his love and his grace towards us. And is willing to use us. And does use us. Many times in spite of our failures. So I want us just to kind of lay the groundwork this morning, and I want us to begin with David's rise from insignificance. We'll be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, you can download the app if you have it. There is a Bible there, or there's one up under the chair in front of you. While you're turning, just to give you some perspective if you're not too familiar with your Old Testament, you remember God wrote, raised up a man named Moses to lead the Jewish people out of bondage, out of slavery from Egypt. And so Moses, God uses to lead the people out of Egypt. They enter into that wilderness area. And after a while, God raises up another gentleman, a military man named Joshua, who actually leads the people into the land that God says, I will give you. Just follow as I lead. I will push your enemies out before you. I will give you cities that are built and ready to occupy. I will give you vineyards and orchards that are pruned and growing. It's all yours. Just follow me. So Joshua led the people into the land. And then once they were into the land, remember all the way back to Genesis 12, God had said, I'll be your king. I'll protect you. I'll provide for you. Anything you need, look to me. I'll be your king You'll be my people, and you will display my glory for the world to see. And God provided a number of prophets who, who rose up and spoke for God to the people. And you go into the period of judges, and you have these judges and prophets, and they, they speak to the people, and they bring them back to God, because just like you and I, they, they, they drift quickly and easily in life. And one of those was Samuel. Samuel. And this is a little bit of the story of how David came to be. Reading from 1 Samuel 8, beginning with verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel and Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us just like the other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, 
but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like, how silly can you be? Well, we do it all the time. God's saying, I'm here. I'll provide anything and everything you could possibly need. Just look to me. And the people say, nope. We want to look to a man to protect us, to provide for us. Verse 10, so Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people. Nope, I'm sorry, verse 8, let's go back, I missed. According to all the deeds that they had done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who will reign over them. And then he very clearly begins to tell them what having a king really is all about. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. And he said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of 50 and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and to equip his chariots. And he will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and all of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servant and your female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also will be like the other nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel had heard all these words of the people, he repeated them to the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice, make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. The people of Israel wanted a king. Samuel, the prophet who had reigned well and taught truth, was growing old. That's true. Samuel's sons, who should take over his role, were were evil, wicked, crooked men, not fit for the role or the job. The people knew that. That was true. But more than anything, the people wanted a king so they would be like the other nations around them and turn their back on God. It's a little bit of an aside there. If you notice that God never forces his purpose, his plan, even when it's for our best on us. I mean, if we're going to be stubborn enough to turn away from him and follow our own way and think we know best... He basically says, go ahead. Go ahead. If you want to go through life as a cheat and a lie, go ahead. As a believer, is forgiveness there? Yeah, it is. But if you want to look to self rather than to God, you have that option. If you want to live a life of unforgiveness and hate, you have that choice. If you want to live together before marriage, have multiple sex partners, marry and divorce, marry and divorce, marry and divorce, live for self, amass money, look only to self and my needs, we have that choice before us. Proverbs 14, 12 says there's a way that seems right to man. We face this choice Every day, don't we? We come up to a a situation, a decision in business, and there's a there's it just seems right to do it this way. I mean, besides, everyone else is doing it, it really won't matter. 
but its end is the way of death. We can, re we can reject his ways. And I'm talking to believers here. We can still reject his ways. We can reject his truth. We can reject the life he offers of joy and peace and security and fulfillment. And he won't stop us. But he will allow the consequences of those choices to play through. He has our best at heart. He wants his very best for us. But if we are determined, as that word in the Old Testament, to be stiff-necked and to look our own direction, ultimately he will let us go that way. Interesting thought there. Well, you come on down, the story continues, and ultimately the people choose Saul in 1 Samuel 13. If you go and you read there, Saul is tall, he's dark, he's strong, he's handsome. But he has no heart really for God. He looks to self. He looks like a king, but he acts like a fool. And ultimately, God rejects him as king. 1 Samuel 13, 13, just look at it on the screen. And Samuel says to Saul, you have done foolishly. He's been very disobedient to God's direct command. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be the prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you to do. And so in Israel's history at this point, it's a time of confusion, disillusionment. Um, you're looking for a leader, and there's no leader to be found. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? You're looking for direction, and there's no direction. Right is wrong, and, 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 and it's just kind of a muck. And the nation is just kind of prodding along. And then we come to 1 Samuel 16, where not the people, but God chooses David. Another side here. Isn't God graceful? I mean, they demanded a king. He let them have their king. It was a bad choice. But in his grace, he brings to them, if they want a king, he brings them a man who seeks his heart, who can bring them peace and prosperity. So even in their, even in their stiff neckness and self-sufficiency, God shows grace and provides a man who can rule well. Let me back up. 1 Samuel 16, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse the, Beth the Bethlehemite, for I provided for myself a king among his sons. And then just let me just read this next little section, coming down to verse 6. So Samuel goes to Jesse in Bethlehem. He says, God says there's a king here. Let me see what you got. Let me see your sons. And so they start parading across, starting with the oldest. And when they came, he looked at Eliab, the eldest son, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. I mean, he's the oldest son. He, I mean, that would be logical. But the Lord said to Sam, do not look on his appearance, on his height, or his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called his next son, Abinadab, and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And you can imagine Samuel and, and, and uh, Jesse at this point, they're scratching their head. This doesn't make sense. This is not the way it works. You, you always choose the firstborn, and if for some reason that would the second. Okay. 
Verse 9. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord's not chosen any of these. It's a little bit like Cinderella, doesn't it? Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are these all the sons? I mean, God sent me here to anoint the next king, and so far, no king. Jesse says, there remains yet the youngest. And behold, he's out in the fields. He's keeping the sheep. He's just a boy. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down until he comes. And he sent and brought him in. And now he was gruddy and had beautiful eyes, and he was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. David comes out of absolute obscurity. I mean, even his own father didn't think to invite him in to meet with Samuel to possibly be the king. I got seven other sons. Don't mess with this character. So that's David's rise from insignificance, from a, literally a stinky shepherd out in a field to king of Israel with one brief visit. So we have David's rise from insignificance. Then we have David the man, just briefly. Do you realize, I did not realize, so I got to look at, there is more written about David in the Old Testament than any other character, hands down. Now think about I me, mean, Abraham, Moses, 14 chapters to Abraham, 14 chapters to Joseph, 11 chapters dedicated to Jacob, 10 to the prophet Elijah, 66 chapters dedicated to David, and then another 60-some references in the New Testament to his life. He had no particular prominence as a young boy. He was the youngest of Jesse's sons. There wouldn't be much left of the inheritance the time it got to him. He was a tender of sheep. He never attended an Ivy League school. His father Jesse had no particular prominence. He wasn't someone important. He certainly wasn't born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He came out of Bethlehem. Pretty much a little insignificant suburb city of Jerusalem where sheep were raised. No particular prominence. And yet God chose to use him mightily. Even in light of his failures. He was a shepherd, yes. Incredible poet. Wrote half of the Psalms that you have in your Bible. He was a musician by God, gifted to play the harp. Remember, as we'll see later, God uses him to calm the, 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 the evil heart of Saul as he played for him. He was a prophet. God used him to predict, especially in the Psalms, the coming Messiah through his writing. He's probably best known to you and I as a warrior, We'll look shortly at the story where he takes on Goliath. He was such a warrior that in Chronicles 28, God says, No, you can't build my temple, David, because there's too much blood on your hands. That'll be left to your son. And then, as I said before, an incredible king, an incredible king that brought security and prosperity to the people of Israel. If we step back and we look at David, they tell us we have to do this with, with presidents. You, you, you should never draw a conclusion about a president just as he ends his term. You need to let history play out 20, 30, 50, 100 years and then look back and get the whole picture of what was going on. And if we do that to David, if we gain that perspective and we look at David, we realize the reaction would probably be mixed. There's plenty in David's life to give his enemies fuel to throw at him. But God's own words 
sum up David the best. For all the gifts that God pours into David, for all the ways that God uses David, for all the failures in David's life, God says, David is a man after my own heart. Isn't that an incredible statement? With all the success and all the failures that we all go through life, to come to the end and be able to have it said, a man, a woman, a young person, after God's own heart. God chose David. Not because of looks. It sounds like he was handsome enough, but not anything special beyond any other Jewish boy at the time. Not because of his family or incredible gifts, but because of his heart. David, a man after God's own heart. What does that look like? What does that feel like? Well, what was important to God was important to David, even as a shepherd. Listening to God, tuned in to God, even when he screwed up. Humble. Not always, but in general, humble before the Lord. Willing, not even necessarily quick, but at least willing to admit wrong. A desire deep within to to please God through his actions. A desire to live to honor God. He loved God. Was aware of his work in his life. And he was thankful. A mindset. A heart attitude. a, A direction of focus towards God and God's working in his life. David, a man after God's own heart. That's David. But it can also be you and me. Sitting here in Cottonwood, Minnesota this morning. The world we know, the world looks for beautiful people, handsome people, chiseled people, gifted people, youthful people, athletic people. That's what the world wants. God looks for humility of heart. You can have all those other things and still be humble at heart. That's what God's looking for. David realized that his abilities came from God's hand and were not his own. Two quick verses. I'll close this up pretty quick. First one you've heard, you and Iwanas, you've memorized this verse, but the truth in this verse is so telling. Ephesians 2, for by grace you've been saved. It's what we're singing about, it's what we're about. That's the good news message through faith. And this is not of your own doing. You had nothing to do with it, folks. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that we can boast And then he steps beyond that idea of just salvation into the life we live with God. He says, and now basically, you are his workmanship. Not some of you, all of you. As believers in Jesus Christ, you are his workmanship. He is working in you here this morning. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's his purpose which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. It reminds me back, when, back in the Old Testament when, when God was trying to get the people to, to, to step out in faith and to step into the land that he was giving to them. He says, it's yours. I'll give it to you. I'll chase your enemies out. Just walk in them. Just walk in. Take the land. Follow me. I've already prepared the works for you to do, God says. Walk in them. Walk in them. Then with that, when 1 Corinthians 1.26, consider your calling, brothers. Better switch it over here. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. 
Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. So there's not too many of us here this morning that would consider ourselves noble or exceptionally gifted or talented. We've got some things we can do, but there's plenty of people that can do it better. God loves taking that which is foolish, that which is not polished, that which is raw, and doing his work through it. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, overlooked by the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. A man after God's own heart. This morning, maybe you're here and you're, you're pushing 80. And you think, I'm done. I've done my thing. God doesn't need me. My effective years are past. Or you look in a mirror and you say, who, me? No way. I'm sure there's someone else who could answer to God. You may have never won anything or been picked first for anything. Not, you were not even, you were the last pick for first grade kickball. And you still remember it. You may have come up out of poverty, poverty and abuse as a child. You may only have 20 friends on Facebook. And when you do post something, you're lucky to get two likes and a smiley face. No one follows your thoughts on Twitter. Your kids are grown. Your house is empty. All seems deathly quiet. You're trapped in a dead-end job you hate, and you've got 20 more years to go. The best you could score was a combined 20 on the ACT. You've had a divorce. Your husband, your wife, they walked out on you for another person. You've committed a crime. You served time. You never attended college, or you did go to college and you failed out. What is God's message to us this morning as we look to David? Well, I say it would be this. God is after a man who seeks his heart. God is saying, I love you. I've saved you. You are mine. I am at work within you. And I have plans. And I have a purpose for you. He says, I love to take the old, the plain, the marginalized, the overlooked, the broken to do my work. God can and will use you if you are humble and open to him. As a nurse, a doctor, a student here this morning, a businessman or woman, an electrician, a teacher, administrator, a cook, a mom, a single dad, a convicted felon, there's no fine point. There's no lawyer legalese in God's promise there in Ephesians. He has a purpose, and he has a plan, and he loves taking that which is broken and working through it. And just a quick aside here. Maybe you're here this morning, and you are popular. Maybe you do have the good looks. Maybe you are gifted. Maybe you are smart. And God can use that as you hand that to him. But be careful. Be careful. It's very easy to become prideful in what we have and what con- tends to come naturally. But just tongue-in-cheek here. The blonde hair one day grows thin, turns gray, and even falls out. The pecs, triceps, and hot booty, <laughs> they all move south. They hang out around the middle, and there's very little you can do to stop it. All that tanning looks great, turns to wrinkles, 
and skin cancer. Strong legs grow weak, sore, and stiff. Guys, good game Friday night. It happens a lot faster than you think. A day is coming when your best friend is not a protein shake, but two Advil and a glass of water. (laughs) But the Bible message is the same. May we all live life in such a way that on our tombstone like David it might read, a man, a woman, after God's own heart. Let's pray. Father, once again, we look a little deeper inside.